Thank you for the kind introduction. This is, uh, you know, anytime I have an opportunity to speak, it's always with a touch of intrepidation because you've taken your Wednesday night, you've worked hard, you've come out, you've had a, a full meal, and, and now you've got to try to listen to me for a few minutes. And so there's always a touch of intrepidation, but I'm very excited about the material that the Lord blessed us with. And uh, I will share you know, just a couple of pictures to start, but then we're going to get right into it. It's not going to be as much of a review of the actual retreat as it is of the material that we went over during the retreat. 36 people left Greenville on Thursday morning to, uh, two months ago. There was 29 youth members and seven chaperones. Um, we had a, had a fantastic time we were there. This was the, the room that we were in. It was right on the beach. It was somewhat secluded from, from a lot of other people. We all got in a big room, big, you know, big circle, uh, all, all 36 of us. Um, the Lord was merciful with the accommodations. Uh, outside there was a, a fire pit that was a little too cold to sit on the stones, so we pretty much just stood over it um, until the wind blew the wrong way, and then we went back inside because it was 25, 30 degrees that night. Um, one of the favorite things for the youth to do is just to play Thunderball. It's a group game. Everyone gets to be together and cheer each other on. That's the ball there in the middle of the air. Um, Zach led a group of guys to take it all the way out there and stick it as close to the water as we could, actually. At one point, we had to move it because the tide was coming in and starting to wash away part of the sand. This is the T-shirt that, we, uh, that was designed by the youth group members, and it's, it's quite simple. It's Communication 101, and it's growing in favor with God and man. That was our goal for the entire retreat, and we wanted to do it through what we could learn about communication. There's just two people in the Bible, uh, Jesus and Samuel, that were both told but grew in favor with God and man. And both people are great examples for us and, and were for the youth, and so we used those, that, those terms and that description to jump into communication. So here we go, and I'm going to have to go quite quickly, so please please keep up as, as best that you can, but there's a ton of information. I think our pastor told me 12 to 15 slides, and um, there's a lot more than that right now. So we're going to move quickly. This topic can change your life. I hope you believe that. If you don't, um, you're not going to get a whole lot out of what we say next, but it can change your life. If you can understand the, the basics of communication and how it works, then it can change your life. It's the path to perfection. Uh, we'll start with communication because we know that to be a perfect man, you've got to learn to control your speech and your tongue. Yes. And so it's a yes. part yes. of right. learning to be a perfect person is to, is to work on your communication. Amen. You will grow in favor with God and man if you can grasp this idea. Right. Yes. So if you can learn to communicate, you will grow. The ability to effectively communicate is one of the most sought after traits for men and women. Studies right. and studies have been done. What is a guy looking for in a girl? What is a girl looking for in a guy? And almost all of them have right near the top the ability to effectively communicate. Because as you grow in in life, you realize pretty quickly that very few people have, have learned to do so. Yeah. And there's, there's a number of reasons why we'll, we'll hit several of those. And we want to be the eloquent orators that are disappearing from the face of the earth. Yes. And if we can learn to speak clearly, concisely, and effectively, we can be those people in the midst of a time when they're disappearing. You'll enhance your chances of success in regards to your employment, the opposite sex, friends, relatives, and etc. Okay, as soon as you can learn to communicate correctly, you will enhance your success in those areas. Everything we do, and this is an important point that we'll hit several times, everything we do, say, think, and feel is communicating something to someone. Right. And so just a quick example, someone says, well, I don't yes. talk much and don't do much. Well, you are communicating to people that you don't talk much and you don't do much, and that in and of itself is communicating something to someone. This topic can take us in many different directions, and so please bear with me as we don't ex exhaust very many of them. We will only touch on many of them. We're going to hit just briefly the temperaments and the love languages, personalities and body language, and there's many other areas we can find ourselves going towards. But for sake of tonight, we're going to hit, hit them very quickly. A couple of disclaimers, and I, I, I built tonight's presentation off of what we did at the retreat, and so there were certain things that I wanted them to understand as we got started. Uh, that they did not feel like we were going in any particular direction, so these disclaimers are, are off of that list. This is not an exhaustive study, so please understand that if you see a point and know there could have been more said, I agree. Tonight's presentation is just to get you thinking, and this is how I'd like to do that. During the retreat, there was only a 14-year age, age group gap. Tonight we've got one that's around 90. Okay, so there's a whole different set of people, a whole different group that we're talking to tonight. So please understand that much of what was put together was, was geared towards the youth group. And so I, I understand that. And it's a disclaimer for tonight's presentation. Some of the things said will be somewhat light and it may seem disrespectful. 
but there, it's not. It's intended for a purpose, so please view what's said in some of the slides in context of the subject matter and who we were intending to hit and who we were more so trying to hit tonight. Okay, what is our objective? We want to build a better relationship with God. Amen. Simple. That is the objective. We want to build better relationships with others after we build yes. that better relationship with God. We want to be intentional in everything that we do. And communication is something that we forget and is one of the first things that we stop being intentional. We just let things happen too quickly and we want to be very intentional in it. I want to help you leave with one thing you can change in your communication. Okay, this, is, this is my goal for you. This is our objective tonight. Two, if you can handle it. Okay, so I was told to put these slides in here from, from one amongst you. Okay, so I want you to leave with one thing. Two, if you can handle it. Only three if it does not lower your chance of leaving with two. Okay, so if trying to get a third one lowers the possibility of two, stick with two. That'll be great. And as, as we were told uh, just recently, we'll take a onesie, which means if you can get one thing out of tonight and go in the right direction, mission accomplished. The definition, the imparting or exchanging of information or news. Not necessarily talking or listening, but imparting information. So something's yeah. being transferred between one person to another person, one person to several, or even one person to a group, or vice versa. A process by which information is exchanged between individuals through a common system of symbols, signs, or behaviors. Okay, so the, the saying goes, not all common sense is, is common to everybody. Okay, so I understand that we all have different ways we communicate, but there is a common set that we want to stick to. This is how we broke it down. So similar to a class, we had four sections to the class that we were trying to teach, so to speak, and here's the four. We talked about hearing God, talking with God, learning to listen, and then what are you saying? And that's exactly how we broke it down, and you'll see that as we move along. So the question then is, when does four become one? Okay, so we had one objective, but that was four different components. So here's our four again. When do these four become one? The four areas for one common goal. And that common goal is to grow in favor with God and man. So to just say we want to grow in favor with God and man does not explain how we do that and how that breaks down. And so we use these four sections to try to get into more bite-sized pieces so that we could actually have some, some information and material to go home and work on, as I hope to give you tonight. All right, first, here we go. And I'm not going to spend as much time on the first two of hearing God and talking with God because you get much of that through the Proverbs, through preaching, through daily devotionals, I'm going, to, I'm going to be very brief on these, but it's not to, to discount the importance of them. It is purely because you get so much of that in so many other areas, we'll focus a little bit more on the practical side of actual communication with, with individuals with each other. But I do want to go through a few of these because if you don't get these points down, you, you start to lose the ability and the luster of what you can offer anybody else. So here's how we approached it. Has God spoken? And that's the first thing you've got to ask yourself if you want to hear God, has God spoken? Yes. He's given us a more sure word. Amen. Okay, so he could have actually spoken to you in a real voice, and it would not have been as valuable and as sure as the word of God that he has given to each and every one of us. Right. He wrote his words down so we wouldn't forget. Amen. If he had, if he had just spoken to us, you would have to rely on your memory. I don't want to rely on my memory. Okay, I forget things from day to day, nevertheless, from year to year and decade to decade. But he's written it down for us. Our memories are so subject to change, but his word is not. His word will never change. It is steadfast and sure throughout all generations. The written word is the perfect way to make sure nothing is missed. If you had been given a recipe verbally, the chance of you missing a portion of that recipe as you went to, to fix something is pretty high. You can't miss anything with the recipe of success in God's word. You may ask, why did he not just write me a personal letter? He did. Yes. He wrote you a personal letter. Okay, now this is one of those points, and I'll say this a couple times throughout here. If there's, if there's a couple things I want you to really grasp, this is one of them. Here's how he did it. Okay, so everyone says, well, he didn't write me a personal letter. I don't have a book with my name on it particularly addressed to me from the pen of God. Well, you kind of do, but this is how he did it. Instead of writing 10 billion letters, okay, to give one to each of his saints, assuming that there's 10 billion saints, Instead, he wrote one letter and created 10 billion unique yous. Okay, so he wrote one book and created each of you different, and in essence, created 10 billion different books because each of us grabbed that Bible and he shows us different things yes. at different times. Yes. And so if each of us will take God's word and make it our unique letter, it becomes unique in that way. 
And it, to me, it's much more efficient than trying to create 10 billion books that we would probably need re, re put together and so on. This book, this Bible, this unique letter to you, it transcends temperament, experience, age, gender, time, and everything else. Amen. And so as we go through some of these slides on communication, they're going to be particular to some people, some demographics. The Bible transcends every demographic yes. out there. Right. Um, we need to understand that and make it our personal book to us. So here's another way we phrased it. What would you want to hear from God that he has not said? Okay, so when we communicate with each other, sometimes we wish the other person would say something in particular. So what is it that you wish God had said to you that he has not said? Well, I think a lot of people want to hear I love you. Just a simple I love you. Parents to kids, kids to parents, husband to wife. You want to hear I love you. You're loved with an everlasting love. Amen. I don't know how else you could have worded it more efficiently and more powerfully than you're Amen. loved with an everlasting yes. love. I will take care of you. Okay? You're in the king's pavilion. I don't know of a safer place you could possibly be. Amen. And he's put you there and told you that you're there in his word. I'll always be there for you. Okay? How about I will never leave you nor forsake you? Amen. Okay, I think he's, he's said all the things that we would want to hear yes. from somebody else. Personal devotions. And listen, we're, we're, we're not hearing God, so I'm going to go, go quickly to finish up this section. But personal devotions need to be careful when, you, when we're, we're talking about actually trying to hear God. When we have personal devotions, we want to see God and hear what he has to say to us. Yes. That's yeah. the purpose of opening up God's word in a private time of devotions with him. We want to learn about how he wants us to live. We want to get into his word to know more about how he wants us to live. And it's not a time to try to disprove doctrine, but rather to confirm it. Right. Okay, now this was another slide that I was pushed to put in here. What this means is, is that there's a time and a place to prove the doctrine of, of the Bible. And there's a pastor to do it, and there's other people to help you do it. When you have personal devotions and this kind of communication, it's for you to go in there and make God a personal relationship with you. And to do it by confirming the things that he's told you to do, not trying to, to dig up some new doctrine in his word. We have, there's, there's, there's ways that that's done. And we have a pastor that, that pushes hard to do that, and there's noble men in this church that search those scriptures. But at your personal time of devotions, make them that, just that. We want to establish what we've been taught by the, the other spheres of authority in our lives. So when we go to God's word, instead of trying to think that we figured out some new, better way to do it, we ought to look back and see what we've been told and taught before and do those things first. And then the Lord may show us something in time. We cannot think the Lord will show us some new thing in his word if we're not doing what he's shown us already. We've, we've got to have that approach when we open up God's yes. word that what have I been told yes. and how can I do it better and more, and more fully for him. How else does God speak to me? Through counselors. There are well and a wellspring, according to Proverbs 10, 11, and 18, 4. There's safety in counselors. Amen. He talks to us through the Holy Spirit. That was Amen. just mentioned, and it's been preached extensively recently through John. But he left us with the comforter inside us. That is another way that he speaks to us. A quick couple points here on a counselor. A question came up before and during the retreat. How do you pick a counselor? What does a counselor look like? How do you, how do you know you've got a good one? This is a very simple and certainly not exhaustive way to start picking a counselor. Do they have experience in what you need help with? Then they can help you. Were they successful in dealing with that issue? And do others go to them for other matters of counsel? And the question came up, so we put it in here just to give you another way God can speak to you. If you don't see something in his word and you haven't gotten it from one channel of or sphere of authority, you've got counselors in your life, you need to go to them. Here's a way to sift to make sure you have a good one. I'm never going to have enough time to get through everything. Okay, we're going we're gonna to go a little bit quicker on the, some of these slides. I'm, I'm, I'm going to end up with uh, a little it's bit of trouble. It's my fault. You just inherited <laughs> Okay, we've got, we've got a list of examples. There was, a, there was an analogy that we used back there about hearing God, and it's a great analogy, but you're going to have to come, come ask a youth member or myself after the fact. Talking with God. Okay, we're switching here, so please, please see that this is going to come from a whole different angle. We, we went through hearing God, now talking with God. What do we mean when we say talking with God? Okay, what does that actually mean? We, we, we sometimes refer to, I had a conversation with God or I talked to him, but it's, it's truly that. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. Yes. It's building a relationship versus performing a review. Right. I, don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself in the middle of a conversation with the Lord or even in prayer, and I'm trying to like update him on what's going on in my life, like he doesn't already know. Like I'm trying to check boxes off of, of, a, of a review sheet. It's like speaking to a friend. Right. It's not just praying, but praying's part of it. We, we need to pray. We're taught to pray. We're, we're told to pray. 
but it's an everyday, ongoing conversation and dialogue. It's something right. that, can, that can be alive and in you. It's something you do when you're driving, when you're working, when you're in the middle of, yes. of many things. We tell our friends everything. Fears, hopes, dreams, frustrations. Why should God be different? If God has said everything to you that you would ever want to hear, then what have you not said to him? So if he's done his part and communicated freely and fully with you, where, where are you wrong in what you've said back to him? This is the way we phrased it out to the, to the youth, and I think this made a lot of sense. In talking with God, we have a problem. And here's the problem. We treat God like an ATM machine. Okay, and that's not to be disrespectful, but think about it. We need something, so we go to God. We want something, so we go to God. We're in trouble, so we go to God. We need to stop talking at God, but rather with Him. It needs to be a conversation. It needs to be a dialogue. He's spoken right. to us. He's given us His Word. He's told us everything, but yet we only go to Him when we have a need of something. You know, we're out of money, so we head to the ATM. You know, we need something from the Lord during our day, and so we decide to stop and pray then. Why, why would we think He would hear us at that point if we haven't established a relationship and actually yes. spoken and talked yes. with Him? Amen. We don't spend enough time delighting in Him, but we're more than thrilled to bring Him our requests. And that needs to be flip-flopped. Yes. We need to be delight yes, in Him more than anything. And then, in time, yes. if He, you know, per adventure gives us the opportunity, we can come to Him with our requests. But it needs to be a priority. There's some stigmatisms here. God is, not, is to only be feared. That's not true, according to God's Scripture. We are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But it's a stigmatism that sometimes we grow up thinking, well, God's this, this horrible being in the sky that I ought to only fear and be afraid of. No. We think sometimes God does not want to hear from me. He, in his own scriptures, mocked idols because they have ears but hear not. Right. In difference to what he has. He has ears and yes. he hears. But the only way he can hear is if you speak. God is only to be spoken to in formal prayer. People in the Bible spoke to God at all times and all manner of, of other events and things that they were doing. Again, those were stigmatisms, things that we need to make sure that we get through. Some examples, you know, Moses spoke to him face to face. Abraham spoke to him. You know, what wilt thou give me in, in the promises in, in Genesis? David spoke to him in the Psalms. Many of the Psalms are in a first person to, to the yes. Lord, directly to him. Beautiful. How does God hear a sinner like me? This is one of my favorite slides, but I'm going to have to go quickly. Jesus died to purchase access to God, right. Romans 5.2, by whom we also have access, Ephesians 2.18, and for through him we both have access, yes. in Ephesians 3.12. We have access directly into the presence of God, and he wants to hear us. He sent his son to die so that that access could be granted and given to us. Okay, learning to listen. This is the most important part of effective communication. And here we transition from the spiritual side, growing in favor with God, more to growing in favor with man. But it is a part of growing in favor with God. A pair of glasses, randomly thrown into a set of slides. We need glasses. We need to understand the temperaments and love languages. What I mean by the glasses and these temperaments and love languages is that if you do not understand certain things about other people when you go to communicate with them, you will not be able to clearly understand what's happening. Quickly, there's four temperaments. Each of them have varying uh, character traits to them. Phlegmatic, cleric, melancholy, and sanguine. We went over those. Some of the young men presented those to us so that we had those as we approached into to communication. Here's a chart that I think does a pretty good job of breaking down what those four temperaments look like. Something that you might review in time if you don't know the four temperaments very well. But they, they split it up a little bit differently, but they give you some additional uh, information so that you can understand what each of those four are. Here's the five love languages. Again, a set of glasses that if you can understand them, you can understand a little bit more about how people communicate and why they do certain things that they do. There's people that have these different love languages. So they're words of affirmation, gifts, quality time, acts of service, physical touch. Sometimes people change as they rotate through these, these uh, gifts, the um, love languages. And so as they grow older or you know, become married and so on, sometimes these change, but it's important to know about them. Learning to listen. This is another big point. Familiarity breeds contempt. We seem to break the rules yes. with those closest to us. So we like to forget about the temperaments and the love languages with those we're closest to. But if we could learn to keep these rules with the ones closest, everyone else, it becomes much easier to communicate with them. 
but its spouses and its fathers to their children and mothers to their children and children to their parents are the ones that start to break down on these rules because they're sure that they should have already known these things. I've been your child for 15 years. Why don't you know this about me? That's, that's, we, we have to, to keep up those rules at, at home as much or more than anywhere else. They should be the ones we pay the closest attention to, but they're the ones we neglect the quickest. We say they should know me, but we've not allowed them to keep up. Okay, so we have not given ourselves to be able to communicate clearly with them because we have forgotten because of the familiarity we have. We pay closer attention to everybody else. You'll find yourself, as you think about communication, when you're having a, a conversation with somebody you don't know very well, you pay very close attention to some of the things we'll go over here in just a minute, but yet we're having a conversation with somebody we know very well, and we forget all of these things and, and lose the ability to really communicate with them. Listening is like deciphering a code. Everything you are hearing and seeing is part of the code, so you've got to be very attentive and, and pay close, you know, close attention to what's going on. You need to break it down to crack the code. Okay, so the idea of communication and effectively communicating is learn to crack that code that's, that's actually happening right there in front of you, through your eyes and through your ears. You'll need to listen very carefully. Two ears and one mouth should make the import, should, should show the importance of being of this being obvious. Amen. We we joke about this with you know two ears and one mouth. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, it it should say you should probably cut your words in half because you, you know what you hear and what you should say. But just keep that as a reminder when you're in a conversation that you should be hearing at least yes. twice as much as you're saying. Yes. Just as a basic rule of thumb. So this is someone that has not figured that part of it out. A lot of me, 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 and scaring the poor girl you're talking to. Learn to listen. Okay, so reasons for ineffective listening. This is, uh, this is where it kind of comes into what can we do and how can we change on a, on a one-off basis. The inability to realize that not everybody is like you. Okay, this, I believe, is one of the number one reasons that people cannot listen effectively. Everyone's sure that everyone else is like them, and therefore they should be able to understand what they're saying at any given time. Wrong. That's completely wrong. Yes. Actually, it's so wrong that there's nobody like you. Okay, so there's only you, which means everybody else must be different. We need to understand the differences in the personalities, upbringing, experiences, gender, age, temperaments, etc., to understand that everybody is different than you. Mm -hmm. Even somebody that is just like you is different than you in some way, form, or fashion. Another point for reasons for ineffective listening, we assume instead of clarify. So we're talking to somebody, we're having a conversation, they start to say something, and the first thing we can think of is, I know exactly what that is. And so we'll, we'll actually interrupt them and cut them off and thinking that we can finish their sentence. And the gracious ones will just smile at you and let you go on realizing you have no idea what they were talking about. But the other ones will cut you off and tell you that you didn't know what they were talking about so that you can cut them off again and say that you did. And we assume instead of clarify. Be careful you do not let your perception become the reality. Right. Okay, yes. So the reality is what's being said to you whether you understand it yet or not. <coughs> you can't let your perception get right. in the way of that. Good. Other reasons for ineffective listening. The ability to understand the speaker's perspective. The inability to understand the speaker's perspective. We assume. We guess. We get hung up on the wrong word. We ask the wrong question. We only heard the answer we wanted. We forget who was even speaking to us. Yeah. Those are all things that we can do just completely disregarding exactly what's going on in the conversation. Here's a list that I put together that, I, that was helpful to uh, some of the youth and helpful to myself just to kind of see it broken down this way. So a proactive listener which is what we want to be as a focused, engaged, clarifying, intentional a listener that has great eye contact, lets the speaker lead, actually listens and wants to know more. Okay, that's how they're listening. They're trying to learn more and know more. Nice. However, the reactive listener starts to wander, daydreams, gets very assumptive, disjointed in what they respond, no eye contact. The listener tries to lead, so they're constantly pushing things back to what they think they're hearing, <coughs> looks for opportunities to speak, I, I know I've caught myself doing this, having a conversation and waiting for a little bit of silence so that I can jump in there and make sure that I get my next sentence out and can really care less about the conversation when it's all said and done. Oh, Lord, save us. Rules for effective listening. The power of the pause. Okay, if there's one thing that you can leave with tonight, this is one that I would strongly suggest you consider. The power of the pause. Okay, so we've got a quick pause. It's usually between two and three seconds. You listen to most conversations, there's very few two and three second breaks. Someone stops talking, somebody else picks up immediately. That's how most conversations go. But if you can learn to pause when somebody you're speaking to finishes a sentence for just a moment, they may continue on and finish their thought. They may have more to offer to the conversation. They may actually ask you what you thought. Then there's the slow pause. 
This is actually three to four seconds. Okay, and for some of us, this is impossible to do. Okay, two to three is a pretty tough to do. And by the time you get to three or four, you're okay. You know, do we walk away now or what happens? But but when you when you when you're having a conversation, you're supposed to be able to know there are times for quick pauses and slow pauses, and the pregnant pause. Okay, now this is an actual thing. It's called a pregnant pause and. I thank, thank you to one of the young ladies at the retreat that brought this to us. The pregnant pause is whatever it takes to be uncomfortable. That's why it's called the pregnant pause, because it's uncomfortable. Okay, that was my definition of it. But it's whatever it takes to be uncomfortable. So if you're talking to, think, think about it this way, if you're talking to a phlegmatic, okay, and the mood is, is somewhat you know, quiet or sober, you might need five or six seconds to let them just kind of you know, chew on what you said or what they just said before they're ready to speak yeah, up. That's true. They very well might be waiting long enough to see if you'll leave or to see how engaged you are in the conversation yes. before they'll continue on with, with a little more information. The power of the pause. More rules. Understand who is speaking. Is it a man or a woman? Are they older or younger? Is it a peer or a prince? Are they like you? Are they not like you? All of these things are just pieces of of a prism that if you can learn to look at when you go into a conversation will help you be more effective at what's being said and communicated. Meet the speaker where they are. Okay, so when you approach somebody for a conversation or you're walking into two people already having a conversation, you need to keep these pieces in mind. Look at the emotion. See what's going on during the conversation. See what mood they're in. Find out the tone that they have with each other. You know, there's a big question that came up during the Retreat is if two people are having a conversation, at what point can I enter that conversation without offending the two people? Well, you need to look at these points here as you approach a conversation to see if that's an A-B conversation that you need to see your way out of. Okay, it's, it's getting late. I'm make sure everyone's still with me here. Um, but this is how you can tell by looking through a, a few of these points. You know, they, they, how are they engaging with each other? You need to see if they're mirroring. Okay, this is something that you can do with one person and maybe two, but after that you really can't do it. But it's called a mirroring or reflecting conversation. If two people are doing a mirroring conversation, stay out of it. Okay, they've got something that they're in tune with and they're having a great conversation. You need to see your way out of it. More rules for effective listening. Short focus is better than long and distracted. So you hear someone say, well, I'll listen to them for an hour. Did you hear anything they said for the hour that you were listening to them? you got to stay engaged. Okay? You can't just get engaged. you got to stay engaged. Clarify if confused when you're in the conversation because many times we start to lose interest when we become confused about what they're yeah. actually trying to yes. say. So just clarify. Rephrase to reassure them that you're keeping up with what's going on so that you guys can continue down the same path together. And then watch for the body language. Okay, We don't have time to go too deep into the body language, but body language is a really neat study that is very beneficial to learning how to... to appropriately communicate. Eye contact is by far the number one body language piece that you need to learn. When you have a conversation with somebody, it's said that you should have 80% of your eye contact directly at them and only 20% off to somewhere else. As that group grows, it only goes down slightly from what you need to be looking at when someone's having a conversation with you. Your posture, reactions to what's going on, changes while they're speaking, the stance that they have, the arms, the gestures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could get Zach to come up here and show you what we did at the retreat, but it'd probably make most of you uncomfortable. Um, but there's things that you can do, and when two people are having a conversation, there's where their hands are at and what they're doing with their body and, and the eye contact. All that comes into place in the kind of conversation you can have to be very effective in listening to other people. If you put your hands in your pockets and kind of slump to the side with your eyes to the ground and walk up to somebody and have a conversation with them, you're telling them, I don't really want to have a conversation with you, but somebody told me I had to. Okay, so just keep, keep that in mind. But you walk up with your hands out of your pockets, your face is straight forward, and you look them in the eye, and you stand right in front of them. That person obviously wants to get some information out of me, yes. so let's, yes. let's talk. Quick fact, 7% of a message is verbal, 38% uh, is, is, of the message is vocal, 55% of the message is conveyed non-verbally, 55% of the total non-verbal com communication is facial expressions. These are just known facts from people that have done the studies on this. You have to ask more about some of that later if you're interested. Body language, the five C's. Okay, so this is just a quick summary of the five C's of body language. And there's, there's several different lists out there for the five C's, but I love this one. If you look for the cues when you walk into a conversation, that's the start of the conversation. Look for the cues to see if you should enter the conversation. Look for the changes that start to happen as you approach and get into the conversation and start asking things and see if they're open to you talking with them. That's called the confirmation. Then there's the clusters. The clusters means do they look in you in the eye, do they change their stance to be pointed towards you, and are they taking their hands out of their pockets? Okay, now you've got the validation. They actually want to talk to you. 
Now it's the character, the particulars of what kind of a person you're talking with. So once you've established they're okay talking to you, it's important to understand that I'm talking to a cleric. His voice is going to be a little bit higher. He's going to be a little bit stronger. He's going to be a little bit more forceful, but you need to be aware of that and ready for that. And then the context is just the finish. What were they actually trying to say and why? Okay, so those are just simple fives, the five C's of communication. Okay, what are you saying? Okay, so we've gone over the effective part of listening to people, but what are you saying by the things that you're doing? Everybody falls into one of two categories, and we're really going to focus on speech for this section because there's a lot of other areas we can get into, and we'll hit them just briefly. But everybody falls into one of two categories. They usually either talk too much or they talk too little. Okay, so I think a portion of the room in here just said, yes, you can actually talk too little. Okay, it, it is... It's very painful for people that want to get to know you to understand how to have a conversation with you if they can't get you to talk a little and open up a little bit because a conversation requires two people. Yes, understood. Most people talk too much. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Yes. So for you that talk too little, you do not give life if you do not speak. Okay, so if death and life are in the power of the tongue and you're not using your tongue to help somebody, then you're not giving them life. Now, you might not be killing them, but you're not giving them life. And truthfully, if you're a cleric and you're coming to try to talk to somebody and they don't talk, you are kind of hurting them. So just those of you that talk too little, talk, please. You're hurting others by not speaking. The Lord has put you through the circumstances and experiences of your life for a reason, and there is something that you have that you can offer to the group or to the person that has made the effort to come have a conversation with you. You should not question why no one speaks to you if you cannot hold a conversation. So that also came up as it doesn't seem like right. very many That's people true. want to talk to me. It's because you don't know how to talk. You've got to, you've got to actually right. open your mouth, verbalize, and you get words out there and, and hold a conversation. When being asked to speak, just speak. I don't know what to say. Just talk. What did they ask you? Answer the question. Try to think of a question to ask back. Okay. A couple of verses for those that talk too much. Ecclesiastes 5.3, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by the multitude of words. Not necessarily what he said or how loud he said it, just the fact that there's so many words coming out of his right. mouth, you can guarantee he's a fool. Proverbs 17.28, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. A couple of quotes that I was asked to put in here. Better to keep quiet be thought a fool then open one's mouth and remove all doubt. Right. Wise men speak because they have something to say. Fools speak because they have to say something. Just keep that yes. in mind. When someone's talking in a conversation, you can pretty quickly tell, is that person wise or foolish by the number of words we saw first? But then are they just filling silence because they can't stand not being able to speak when they have the opportunity? Sometimes they don't have the opportunity. Okay, more rules for effective speech. Okay, so we need to meet them where they are. When you go up to have a conversation with somebody, you need to understand who you were talking to. Okay, many times we go into a conversation when you start addressing them as somebody that they're not. We're addressing them as a buddy when they're actually an elder. We address them as a female when they're actually a male. We need to know who we're talking to. We need to know where we're talking to them at. Some people don't like to have loud conversations in the middle of church. Some people don't like to just trade text messages. You need to understand where you're talking at how they need to be talked to. So that's back to the, the love languages and the temperaments. You need to know how they need to be talked to, and you can know that if you can put on the glasses of the temperaments and the love languages. Their gender, their age, experience, all those things need to be understood to have an effective conversation with somebody. Okay, so here's looks like a real effective conversation. Body language again. This time it's what are you saying? Are you looking someone in the eye? Do you have the correct posture for them to feel like you were wanting to talk to them? How are you reacting to the things that they're saying? Do you see the changes that are going on in you and them as you're having a conversation? Are you aware of those things? Your stance, your arms, your gestures, all those things come into your body language and being able to effectively communicate and project to somebody what you want to say to them. All right, this is one of those things off of the speech part, but everything you do says something. That's right. So what you wear says so much. If you dress respectfully, others will respect you. So dress how you want to be treated. Flip-flops, ball caps, and shirt tails have their place. It's the beach, the park, and the backyard. Right. Dress for the job you want, not the one you have. Simple rules to how to dress in public. Okay, so dress where you, how you want to be treated, and even beyond that, dress for the job you want, not the one you currently have. 
Dress with respect for others. Okay, so the shirts that you wear and the neat little quotes and things that are put on them need to be respectful of the other people you're around. It's just a cognizant way of living life, realizing that everything you do, including what you yes. wear, needs to be respectful of others. Flip-flops in public, no matter if your toes are manicured, are still flip-flops in public. I didn't see any flip-flops tonight. I didn't check super close. <laughs> dress like you want to be addressed. So if you want somebody to come up and respectfully address you, then you need to dress that way. Sure. This, is a, this is a stat. Okay, This is a, a known thing. When meeting someone new, you have seven seconds for a first impression. Maybe it's not fair. Maybe it is. I don't know. If you dress a certain way, seven seconds is probably too much. We don't want to you know, judge a book by its cover, but seven seconds. The gig line. Anyone ever heard of a gig line? Okay, a couple of youth retreat members shook their heads. So I feel a little bit better about that. This is a gig line. Okay, so when you're in the armed forces, you are expected to dress a certain way. And if you have any hope of going up in rank or moving on to a new promotion, you're going to come into a formal interview and you're going to have your gig line checked from your Adam's apple downward. Okay, tie, belt, everything has to be lined up a certain way. It's because if they cannot trust you to dress with respect when you come into an interview, they can certainly not be willing to uh, promote you when you might have somebody else's you know, life in your hands. You've got to show respect. Everything you do says something. Study of proxmetrics, we can't go in this tonight very much more than this. When you stand next to somebody to have a conversation with them, know how far to stand. If you're within 12 to 24 inches, you are in their intimate space. Don't have a conversation with somebody within 24 inches of their face. Personal space is two to four feet. Social space, four to eight feet. You, you have to understand these things because when somebody comes up to you and they say something very nice and very kind to you and the person walks away, it's because you just invaded their personal space. There's a whole study that the CIA has figured out and they know how to break down somebody that they need to get information out of. They'll walk into a room, they'll get right in your face, they'll walk out of the room. They'll walk right in the room, get in your face, walk out of the room, and it scares people to death. And the next time they come in the room and get into their personal space, they'll tell you anything you want. Social media and technology. There's a, there's a lot of information on this. There's, a lot of these are basic things. Women speak three times more words than a man does in the course of a lifetime. It's because a woman comes from a, usually a, nature, a nurturing uh, point of view, and so she really wants to explain and clarify and make sure people understand things. Guys are, want to be very efficient, get to the point, and get things done. Just keep that in mind when you're talking to somebody of the opposite sex, guys. Answer text or do not give your phone number out. Sorry if that's harsh, but you know, when somebody's right. trying to reach you and you've given them your phone number and you don't respond to a text, you know, if you can't, it's one thing. But if you don't, it's different. Close the loop. Whenever you've got a conversation loop, close the loop. A little, little bit more on, on social media. You're going to have to look at some of these else another time if you would like. But it's a, there's a cloak of anonymity that social media can give you that you need to be very careful with. Last line here, careful with the emojis. If you speak emoji, there's a lot of emojis. Okay, So we had a little game that we played in the retreat to realize that not everybody sees the same emoji the same way. So be very careful that if you speak emoji, speak it carefully. The difference between, you know, confused and frustrated or angry is pretty close. Another list, Mr. Sarcastic against Mr. Charisma. Don't have time, I'm sorry. Take, take this one, sarcasm. Breathe this, this statement in. Sarcasm is not funny. I only laugh because I'm too scared to tell you how much it hurts. Okay, when you're, when you're using sarcasm to fill silence oh, or to get a point across, the only thing that it's doing is hurting that person. Now, they might be gracious enough never to say it. doesn't mean it didn't hurt. Forgive us, Too often, we use, we use sarcasm as a filler, or we think we're proving a point being creative. The power of the apology. I mean, it's a, it, there's a whole whole list of things we could talk about here. And there at the bottom, the but, but, but. Who's ever heard an apology, and the next thing you hear is but? Sorry I did that, but you know, you were wrong. I mean, it's, it happens all, all the time, and it's, it's not a true apology. It's, a, it's, it's them trying to either you know, get you to stop talking to them or really just a way to turn the whole conversation back to you being the problem. The best apology is the accepted one, so learn to accept an apology when somebody gives it to you. Yes. Okay, let's get to, to just wrap this up. Okay, God has written you a personal letter about everything that matters. Amen. Read it and make it yours. Speak with God, not at him. He wants to have a conversation with you. He expects a conversation with you. He's told you everything he wants to hear from you. Listen with intent. Everything that you do when you walk into a conversation needs to be intentional. 
Know what you are saying at all times, whether verbally, non-verbally, with what you wear, with how you yes. stand. Everything you do, you're saying something. Everything you do communicates something. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get these slides posted so that you can go back and review them. Thank you very much. Excellent job finishing that quickly. The Bible says a lot about our tongue. Right. James chapter 3 is ferocious about the misuse of our tongue, and the book of Proverbs has very much to say about our speech, pro and con, about how we talk. And we want to have those gracious, good lips that we prayed for tonight and to feed many. Did you grab something from all the slides? What did you did you grab something? Mm -hmm. I get to practice on the way home. Yep, just the two of us in the car. Familiarity breeds contempt. I listen to each of you, and you may not know it, but I do try, and I speak to each of you differently than the dearest person on the earth to me. Sick, isn't it? So I get that's something I grabbed <laughs> that I know I should uh, work on. <laughs> Because if I can get better there, then I can get better with you. Did you grab something off one of those slides? You want to come up and invade my personal space? <laughs> or not? Those are a lot of good points, Nathan. Thank you very much. Youth, youth, we're trying to help you outstrip us and be better than us. We want you to communicate better at an earlier age than we did. Stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are never at a want for content. You have taught us so much in your word, and we have not nearly exhausted your word. Yes. Another subject tonight that is so large, so common, something that we're engaged in all the time, either with you or with others, yes. listening or speaking, speaking in all kinds of different ways, have mercy upon us. Cause something from tonight to lodge in our memories, convict us about it, and let us put it into practice yes. that we might be better. Yes. We want to be better for the reason given, Amen. to grow in favor with thee and with men. Forgive us. Our speech sins, yes. and our speech faults, yes. and our speech selfishness, yes. our communication chaos. Have mercy upon us, Heavenly Father. Forgive us. Go with us now to our homes. Bless us with those dearest to us that we live with, that we're related to, that see us every day and we see them. Let us show and practice some of these skills. We thank Thee for Thy precious Word yes. and the Holy Spirit so that we have the passionate, written, confirmed, and more sure Word and the personal, intimate expression of it in our souls by the Holy Spirit. Yes. We thank Thee for that comfort and instruction that You've given us, that light for our path and lamp for our pathway. See us safely to our homes. We thank Thee for all Your mercies and kindnesses toward us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.